Egyptologists find facts to fit their theories when they should be making theories based on the facts. Graham Hancock Mr. Hancock's explanation of the Sphinx and the pyramids make the orthodox Egyptologists look like fools and pseudo-archaeologists. Although Mr. Hancock had a sarcastic tone whenever he referred to the Egyptologists and their theories, he was not knocking their research or research abilities. He is just quite upset about their lack of openness to new ideas. In a way, the Egyptologists have lost their scientific validity by not practicing the scientific method. The best part of science is that nothing should be written off or excluded until it can be disproved. We all thought that scientists were supposed to have open minds. After all, most of what we use and see on this planet started out as someone's thought or hypothesis. Two Egypt experts, Graham Hancock and Robert Bauvel, proposed a theory that the Sphinx and other great Egyptian monuments are older than common history books tell us. Obviously, their theory is a little more than just an educated guess. Despite its iconic status, geologists, archaeologists, Egyptologists and others continue to debate the Sphinx's enduring riddle. Exactly how old is it? Is the Great Sphinx actually much older than Egyptologists tell us, based on recent geological evidence? A gigantic statue with a lion body and the head of a man gazes east from Egypt along the 13th parallel. The Great Sphinx of Giza is the most instantly recognizable statue associated with ancient Egypt and among the most famous in the world. Facing directly from west to east, it stands on the Giza Plateau on the west bank of the Nile in Giza. The Sphinx was not assembled piece by piece, but was carved from a single mass of limestone exposed when workers dug a horseshoe-shaped quarry in the Giza Plateau approximately 66 feet tall and 240 feet long, it is one of the largest and oldest monolithic statues in the world. Thousands of years passed, climates changed, cultures, religions and languages changed, even the positions of the stars and the skies changed, but still the statue has stood the test of time. In modern Arabic, the Sphinx is called Abu al-Hol, the father of terror. How long it stood there inspecting the horizon? Whose image does it portray? Who built it? And what is its function? According to mainstream Egyptologists, the great Sphinx of Giza was fashioned during that period of Egyptian history classified as the Old Kingdom on the orders of the fourth dynasty pharaoh named Khafre, who reigned from 2520 to 2494 BC. This is the orthodox historical view. It's in all standard Egyptological texts, in all encyclopedias, in archaeological journals, and in popular scientific literature. In these same sources, it is also repeatedly stated as fact that the features of the Sphinx were carved to represent Khafre himself. In other words, its face is his face. There's no direct way to date the Sphinx itself because the Sphinx is carved right out of natural rock. 
Professor Mark Lanner from Chicago University's Oriental Institute stated in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal, although we're certain the Sphinx dates to the fourth dynasty, we're confronted by a complete absence of Old Kingdom texts which mention it. To make a point here, stone monuments can be dated with reasonable accuracy if there are contemporary texts which refer to their construction. So, in the case of the Sphinx, what one would require would be an inscription carved during the Fourth Dynasty and directly attributing the monument to Khafre. But as Mark Lanner admits, however, no contemporary text referring to the Sphinx has ever been found. So actually, what confronts us at Giza is an entirely anonymous monument carved out of undateable rock, about which, as the forthright Egyptologist Selim Hassan wrote in 1949, no definite facts are known. Why, therefore, do Mark Lanner and other influential mainstream Egyptologists continue to link the Sphinx to Khafre and to insist that the Sphinx was built under his reign during the Old Kingdom's Fourth Dynasty? Guardian of the ancient mysteries, the keeper of secrets, the enigmatic Great Sphinx of Giza has sparked a wealth of speculation concerning its age its creators, and its original meaning. Since 90s, a wealth of writers have postulated theories indicating the Sphinx is a remnant of an advanced ancient civilization most likely lost to archaeology, one that existed between 9 and 12,000 years ago. If this is so, much of what archaeologists and historians think they know about the rise of civilization must be revised. That idea is as threatening to many scientists today as Galileo's idea that the Earth revolves around the Sun was to the Church hundreds of years ago. At the heart of the controversy seems to be the question of erosion. Was the erosion on the surface of the Great Sphinx caused by rainfall or wind? If the erosion were caused by rainfall, the Sphinx would indeed be thousands of years older than 2500 BC. The origins of this controversy go back to the late 1970s when John Anthony West, an independent American researcher, was studying the works of R. A. Schwaller de Lubbock, an early Egyptologist and mathematician. While reading his works, West found the Lubbock's references to water erosion on the Sphinx and was intrigued. Through some friends, I had an introduction to a very well-known Oxford geologist, and I went into him with a very simple question. On the basis of a clear photograph alone, could he, as a geologist, tell the difference between weathering by water and weathering by wind and sand? The answer was cautiously expressed as a general rule, yes. I asked him if he didn't mind if I play a bit of a trick on him, and what I did was I took a photograph of the Sphinx, and I masked off the head and the paws, and I asked him what did he think that was responsible for that weathering. And he looked at it a moment and said, well, unquestionably, water. And then I stripped the masking tape off, and he looked at it a minute, and he said, oh. Schwaller's simple observation which nobody appeared to have taken any notice of before, obviously challenged the Egyptological consensus attributing the Sphinx to Khafre and to the epoch of 2500 BC. What West immediately realized on reading this passage was that, through geology, Schwaller had also offered a way to prove the existence of another and perhaps greater civilization predating dynastic Egypt in all other known civilizations by millennia. In 1989, John West approached Professor Robert Schoch of Boston University, a highly respected geologist, stratigrapher, and paleontologist. Schoch's specialty is the weathering of soft rocks, very much like the limestone 
of the Giza Plateau. Clearly, he was a man who had exactly the kind of expertise needed to confirm or rebut the theory once and for all. Dr. Robert Schock is an associate professor of science at Boston University. He holds a PhD in geology and geophysics from Yale University. Dr. Schock is an expert in the erosional analysis of rocks. What I found was that West had one very extreme idea that the Sphinx was thousands of years older than the Egyptologists thought. So I thought it was a long shot. I thought maybe West was onto something I thought was very improbable, but it was worth looking at further. I'm a curious type of person. In 1990, Robert Schoke made an initial visit to the site. And although he was unable to gain access to the Sphinx enclosure, he could see enough from the tourist viewing platform to confirm that the monument did indeed appear to have been weathered by water. It was also obvious to him that the cause of this weather had not been floods, but precipitation. In other words, rainwater was responsible for weathering the Sphinx and not floods. At that stage, due to denied access to the Sphinx enclosure, he couldn't confirm West's theory. But why had the geologist from Boston not been allowed inside the Sphinx enclosure? The reason was that since 1978, only a handful of Egyptologists had been granted that privilege, with all public access closed off by the Egyptian authorities and a high fence built around the site. With the support of the Dean of Boston University, Shoke then submitted a formal proposal to the Egyptian Antiquities Organization, requesting permission to carry out a proper geological study of the erosion of the Sphinx. Finally, after a while and because of his imminent institutional backing, Shoke's proposal was eventually accepted by the EAO, creating a brilliant opportunity to get to the bottom of the Sphinx controversy once and for all. They immediately put together a broadly based scientific team, including a professional geophysicist, Dr. Thomas L. Dobecki, from the highly respected Houston consulting firm of McBride, Ratcliffe and Associates. Initially, our primary purpose for conducting the seismic surveys in and around the Sphinx was to look for buried evidence for ancient civilizations. To this end, we were able to locate unusual cavities that could be chambers within the Sphinx enclosure. But over and above this, we were also able to map the pattern of weathering depth within the limestone. Since they could expect nothing but opposition from academic Egyptologists and archeologists, in case the scientific team confirms the geological evidence, a film producer, Boris Said, was arranged to record the ongoing work in a video documentary which would get the theory to the public as otherwise it would simply be denied and buried, possibly for good. The first interesting result came from Dobecki, who had conducted seismographic tests around the Sphinx. The sophisticated equipment that he had brought with him picked up numerous indications of anomalies and cavities in the bedrock between the paws and along the sides of the Sphinx. One of these cavities was described as a fairly large feature that is about 9 meters by 12 meters in dimension and buried less than 5 meters in depth. Now, the regular shape of this, rectangular, is inconsistent with naturally occurring cavities so there's some suggestion that this could be man-made. At that crucial moment, while the members of the team were putting together the first independent geological profile of the Sphinx, John West and his team were physically expelled from the site by Dr. Zahai Hawass, then the Egyptian government's chief inspector of antiquities for the pyramids and Sphinx. He appeared to be angered by the suggestion that the Sphinx might be far older than the civilization of Egypt itself. Shock was encouraged by what he saw, but the team was totally unprepared for what happened next. 
Somehow word of their theory leaked out and they found themselves attacked in the press. This is an American hallucination. They're exploiting the monuments of Egypt for personal gains, said Dr. Zahi Hawass, director of the Giza Plateau. The team is ignorant and insensitive. This from Dr. Mark Lehner, Egyptologist. There is many theories like this has been said about the Sphinx, but all of it gone with the wind. Because we Egyptologists have a solid evidence to state that the Sphinx is dated to the time of Kefren, the builder of the second pyramid at the Giza Plateau. The team had obtained their research permission from Dr. Ibrahim Bekar, then the president of the Egyptian Antiquities Organization. But what they had not known was that relations between Bekar and Hawass were frosty. They were also surprised with Hawass's energy and ego. If there is evidence of lost civilization, where is, where is archaeology? Where is, where is this? And what people write about this are people who sit at home in the air condition and they write all the theories that no one really can believe. Most of the KC people and all the people like who writes about the pyramids and the Sphinx. And I understand that most of you believe in this. One thing, people used to ask me about the Sphinx. There is Sphinx is hidden underneath the Sphinx. I said, okay, then what do you want to do? I said, can you give us permission to drill? I said, why? Why give you permission to drill? Of nonsense, what you believe, it's nonsense. If you give me one accurate evidence as a scientist, I will lead you to drill. Fuming that he had been bypassed by his superior, he accused the Americans of tampering with the monuments and kicked them out of the site. However, his intervention had come too late to prevent them from gathering the essential geological data that they needed. Shok's case rests on the fact that heavy rainfall of the kind required to cause the characteristic erosion patterns on the Sphinx had stopped falling on Egypt thousands of years before the epoch of 2500 BC, in which Egyptologists say the Sphinx was built. Egyptologists argue that the water erosion on the Sphinx could have been caused from the Nile floods that occur in the area, but Shok contends that if that were the case, the floods would have undercut the monument from its base. Instead, the heaviest erosion appears at the top of both the Sphinx and the walls enclosing it. This pattern is more consistent with rainfall from above rather than flood water from below. What you have here are rocks where the lowest most rocks, which are a bit softer than the rocks at the very top, jet out further. If it were Nile floods coming in, you expect these soft rocks to be eroded way back as the waters rose up. You expect this to be eroded way back and it should undercut the uppermost rocks. That in fact is not what we see. If we look up there, we see a little undercutting where you have a very soft layer, but the next layer above which is harder than this layer, is receded way back. So no, it's not Nile floods that are causing this erosion. It's clearly rain precipitation causing these erosional features. One thing I think one has to realize is that the Sphinx itself is in very bad shape in the 20th century. It's deteriorating very quickly. You can literally stand in front of the Sphinx and watch stones fall off of it, smog, pollution, acid rain are all affecting it drastically and weathering it very quickly. And one thing that some critics have suggested is that, in fact, I'm not taking these factors into account, that when I'm looking at weathering, I might just simply be looking at modern weathering features. I just want to assure everyone that I have taken this into account. Yes, it's a very serious problem, the modern weathering, but the weathering that I'm looking at is the ancient weathering, the weathering that we see under ancient repairs, and that's a whole different ball game. That's a whole different um, set of evidence than the modern weathering. Seismic measurements done on the grounds of the Sphinx enclosure point to a difference in the weathering of the rock under the Sphinx. 
the west side of the enclosure, the rump, shows less watering than the other three sides. The northeast and south sides show 50 to 100% more weathering. If we assume that the west side dates to Caffrey's time and the weathering rate of the rock is linear, then the Sphinx would date to 5000 BC at the earliest. If the weathering pattern is nonlinear, the Sphinx could be much older. How would rainfall explain the fact that the head of the Sphinx, which undoubtedly should be affected by rainfall, shows less weathering than other parts? Precise measurements taken of the head and body reveal the head is not proportional to the body. It is much too small. The tool marks on the head are relatively recent, according to Shulk, and he believes that the head was recarved from the original, which had been heavily damaged. The geological evidence therefore suggests that a very conservative estimate of the true construction date of the Sphinx would be somewhere between 7 and 5,000 BC at minimum. According to Egyptologists, in 7 to 5,000 BC, the Nile Valley was populated only by primitive Neolithic hunter-gatherers whose toolkits were limited to sharpened flint stones and pieces of stick. If Shok is right, therefore then, it follows that the Sphinx and its neighboring temples built out of hundreds of 200-ton limestone blocks must be the work of an as yet unidentified advanced ancient civilization. If there was a lost civilization, where are their artifacts? Where is the proof of their existence? Shok and West maintain that archaeologists are looking in the wrong place. There's more than a fair chance that these artifacts are buried underneath silt in the Nile River or under parts of the Mediterranean. In 1999, archaeologists uncovered what they consider to be the remnants of Cleopatra's palace under water in the silt of the harbor at Alexandria, Egypt. Cleopatra reigned from 69 to 30 BC. As a way of getting the theory of an ancient rainfall eroded Sphinx to the public, West's film, The Mystery of the Sphinx, could hardly have been more successful. When it was first screened on NBC television in the United States in the autumn of 1993, it was watched by 33 million people. What was the Egyptologist's reaction? Peter Lecovera, assistant curator of the Egyptian department in Boston's Museum of Fine Arts, said, that's ridiculous and added, thousands of scholars working for hundreds of years have studied this problem and the chronology is pretty much worked out. There are no big surprises in store for us. Other mainstream experts were equally dismissive. And the redoubtable Zawai Hawass, who had tried to nip the geological research in the bud in the first place, had this to say about the Shok West team and their unorthodox conclusions concerning the antiquity of the Sphinx. American hallucinations, West is an amateur. There is absolutely no scientific base for any of this. This man is a thief and a good old doctor. And a good old doctor is going to be much more. He is not an academic. 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 Listen, we listen. Listen. listen, the matter is debated really and it's closed. It is debated closed. It's closed in Chicago by August, Bernard, by everyone. Then you don't want to hear anything. Exactly, I don't want to hear anything. Shame on you. No, please, don't say this. Don't say this word to me. It's a shame on you, not on me. You have a discussion. Don't talk to me. Please, go away from me. Why, why you Why? I don't know. This man did bad things. I don't know who he is dead. This man. And I am going to call 
I, I want to let this man know to end the discount in my Because he's a cop. It's not my own business. Please, I don't want to talk to you. Please. Let me ask you. Just talk. Why someone talk about a kid to someone else? Why? Why are you talking about a kid that has been closed? Why have to open the theory again? The theory is not closed. It is closed. No, it's not. Everywhere. And I don't know why you talk about it. It's not, it's his fucking game. Why do you talk about it? It's you not. have to present your own theory, not to present the theory. It is not closed, sir. Okay, I closed it. And I am all that had to want to close it. I am presenting my own theory. Okay, I'm not going to attend this, sir. I have written your Mr. Bob. I'm not going to attend this. Even before a word is exchanged, one image, and Mr. Hobbas leaves the room. Shane. Shokin West decided to present an abstract of their research of the Sphinx to the Geological Society of America. They were encouraged by their response. Several hundred geologists agreed with the logic of their contentions and dozens offered practical help and advice to further the investigation. Even more refreshing was the reaction from the international media after the GSA meeting articles appeared in dozens of newspapers and the issue of the Sphinx's age was widely covered by television and radio. According to their research, the Sphinx must predate the breakup of the last ice age, which means any time before 15,000 BC, and that is also based on the complete lack of evidence of a high culture in Egypt in 7 to 5,000 BC. If the Sphinx was as recent as 7 to 5,000 BC, we probably would have other Egyptian evidence of the civilization that created it. Since there is no such evidence, West reasons that the civilization responsible for the Sphinx and its neighboring temples must have disappeared long before 7 to 5000 BC. Since 1993, the Egyptian government, on the advice of Western Egyptologists, has not permitted any further geological research or seismic investigations to be undertaken around the Sphinx. This is surprising in view of the momentous implications of Shok's findings and all the more surprising because his original evidence has not yet been convincingly challenged in any forum. On the contrary, as the years passed, Robert Shok has withstood the rigors of scientific peer review several times successfully defending his contention that the distinctive weathering visible on the Sphinx and on the walls of its enclosure, a combination of deep vertical fissures and rolling undulating horizontal covers, is a classic textbook example of what happens to limestone structure when you have rain beating down on it for thousands of years. Robert Shoke also notes that for centuries, starting in the period of the New Kingdom and throughout Roman times, the Great Sphinx of Giza was considered to have been built before the pyramids. Oral traditions of villagers who live in the Giza area date the Sphinx to 5000 BC, before Khafre's time. So much of our knowledge of the ancient world is based on oral traditions and ancient texts. How could the Old Kingdom Egyptians, having taken the trouble to construct the huge Giza necropolis and the rest of the Memphite monuments, fail to make any mention of the Great Sphinx? One possibility, which deserves to be taken seriously, is that they did not mention it because they did not build it, but rather inherited it from a far earlier epoch. The specific person you're referring to mm -hmm. at the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science debate, which I just wanted to make the comment. I went into that thinking that was going to be a debate. I came out of it realizing that they were just trying to set me up to put me down and shut me up forever.
which they were not successful in doing. Why do you think that they're so reluctant to just listen to the evidence and look at the information and, and, and consider the possibility that maybe there had been an ancient civilization? Because it upsets the standard timeline, the standard, standard story, and it also upsets a lot of people's concept of progression. If you ask me how they constructed the Sphinx Temple, they carved out those huge blocks of stone that can weigh 50 or more tons and moved them in such tight spaces with such tight tolerances, I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to— No one really knows. No one really knows. And sometimes people say, you know, you bring in thousands of slaves or whatnot. Well, there's no evidence for that. And where would you have them stand when you're building the Sphinx Temple? Right. You know, there's not enough room to and there's get around. And stones are so big, even thousands of slaves struggle to move them. Yeah, it's not like yeah, something yeah, like, nope, yeah. just and get a couple you, buddies, we're going to move this couch. Yeah, you yeah. Know, we're not talking about that. No, no, no. And, yeah, you can try to hypothesize levers and that type of mm -hmm. thing, but it's— this has been said before, and I've seen. Um, I wasn't there in person, but I've seen off-the-record document, you know, footage of it when they've tried to just construct a little pyramid with very small blocks, and then they um, end up using modern machines, and they still aren't very successful. I mean, so they knew a lot. No, yeah, they knew a lot. So there's a real resistance I find among a lot of my academic colleagues to want to even suggest that people could have known things in the past that we don't know now, or if they knew something in the past that we don't know now, it was so trivial that it was worth forgetting. So, for instance, when we did seismic work and we found the chamber under the left paw of the Sphinx, that's never been explored since, at least not to my knowledge, and they just dismiss it and say, we know there's nothing there. Um, and that was despite the fact that we also found a chamber at the rump of the Sphinx, which I didn't know about at the time, but they already knew about. So it confirmed that our data was good because mm. we were finding something they knew about, but when we find something they don't know about and they don't want to be there, Right. They dismiss it and don't want to pursue it Did, further. Have, they have explored one of those chambers, correct? Is it, did they explore the one that's in the rump? The one in the rump, yes. The one in the rump, but it turns out they already knew about it. It's probably not super significant. It probably is just maybe a Greco-Roman or late period, you know, burial or, or some kind of excavation. The one I believe is important is under the left paw of the Sphinx, which I believe is an uh, archive. When this evidence is supported by physical proof, such as the geographical weathering pattern of the Sphinx, can we afford to ignore the facts simply because they contradict current beliefs? After all, Galileo was right. Earth does revolve around the sun. Thank you for watching and hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. We really hope you subscribe and if you'd like to be notified of future releases, just hit the bell button. Leave a comment. Let us know what your thoughts are on all of this and what topics you'd like to explore in our future videos.